a documentary that closely followed Miyazaki during the production of The Boy and the Heron was aired in Japan on December 16th. The title is Jibri and Hayao Miyazaki's 2399 Days. This video is a rewrite of my previous video based on the new fact discovered in the documentary program. Of the new facts, the first is that Miyazaki called the Grand Uncle Pak-san, which is the nickname of director Isao Takahata when he was storyboarding. Second, it was revealed that Takahata once said in Miyazaki's presence that there are aspects of Miyazaki that have yet to be revealed in his works, hoping that one day he would show them. The documentary focuses on the impact of Takahata's passing away in 2018 on Miyazaki's production of The Boy and the Heron. For those who watched my previous video, the main changes include a section on who are the models for the Grand Uncle and the Heron Man, and a section on the meaning of the building blocks the Grand Uncle offers Mahito. I also added a section about Natsuko's birth house and some minor changes. I added timestamps to the description section of this video so you can skip to those sections. Sorry for using the AI voice last time, I was really rushing to get it done. This time I will narrate myself. Also, I'm so sorry for upsetting many of you by saying that the inscription of the gate of the tower was in French when it was actually in ancient Italian. I meant Italian. I have no idea why I said French. Thank you for joining me once again on our journey to explore this new masterpiece from Miyazaki. Now, let's get started. The Boy and the Heron marks Miyazaki's departure from the confines of the popular entertainment in which he once found comfort. Freed from those boundaries, he has focused more intensely than ever on creating what truly matters to him. It is an extremely rare case of an art animation produced with one of the largest budgets in the history of Japanese cinema. The movie floods the audience with Miyazaki's vivid imagery, even more intense than Ponyo. It immerses you in his surreal world. Everyone experiences the Miyazaki world intensely, but the messages received from this journey are different for each person. To help you build your own opinion, I will explain in order the references scattered throughout the movie, the references to history, Miyazaki's life and previous works, and many works of art that influenced Miyazaki, including animated films. I hope this video will help you on your journey to piece together the mysterious elements in the movie and find meaning in it. This video contains major spoilers for The Boy and the Heron. I suggest you watch the movie first. So, are you ready? The movie begins with Mahito experiencing the loss of his mother Hisako in a hospital fire. Some may mistake this for an air raid, but this scene is based on Miyazaki's childhood memory of witnessing a hospital fire from the second floor of his house. The movie is quite autobiographical for Miyazaki. Mahito's father works as a factory manager in the fighter jet manufacturing business, much like Miyazaki's father and uncle founded the Miyazaki Aircraft Manufacturing Company during World War II. They made canopies for the Zero Fighter. When the Pacific War began, their factory moved to Utsunomiya and Miyazaki's family was evacuated there, mirroring Mahito's experience in the movie. Mahito arrives in a rural town and meets Natsuko, his father's second wife and his mother's sister. Mahito's father married Natsuko in a so-called solo right marriage. It's a way to preserve the family fortune by marrying the deceased wife's sister. Such marriages were not uncommon in Japan at that time. Miyazaki's father had a previous marriage before marrying Miyazaki's mother. Tragically, his first wife passed away from tuberculosis within a year of their marriage. People worried about him since they were deeply in love. Yet within a year of her death, he married Miyazaki's mother. This aspect of his father might be reflected in the story of Mahito's father remarrying Natsuko. In one scene, the movie shows fighter plane canopies kept at home that resemble Ohm's eye shell in Naushika of the Valley of the Wind. Mahito admires them. This is the same sense of beauty as the protagonist of The Wind Rises, Jiro. Miyazaki's philosophy of I detest war, but I appreciate the beauty of fighter planes is evident throughout his works. Miyazaki's family was relatively wealthy even during the war, much like Mahito's family. Seven old maids swarm around the food that Shoichi brings home, saying, Where there's food, there's food. Mahito's father donates money to the school and makes sure his family gets accommodations. A similar situation existed in Miyazaki's own childhood. The film places great emphasis on the bond between Mahito and his mother reflecting Miyazaki's personal experience. During his childhood, his mother was hospitalized for tuberculosis. Even after she came home, she remained bedridden for eight years. 
growing up without her presence shaped Miyazaki's longing for motherhood, which is evident in My Neighbor Totoro and his other works. Even after his mother's recovery, Miyazaki often clashed with her over their differing political views. There remain an epic episode where Miyazaki, with his leftist views, argued with his mother with her conservative views about political issues while crying. Miyazaki's mother's absence and conflict with his mother may be reflected in each of the two mothers in The Boy and the Heron. In the movie, Mahito's mother dies in a hospital fire, while Mahito cannot accept his stepmother, Natsuko. Miyazaki inscribed his life story into the movie in a very specific way. While The Wind Rises focuses on Miyazaki's life as a creator, overlaying aircraft design with animation, The Boy and the Heron depicts his life before his creative journey began. Mahito struggles to come to terms with his mother's death, his father's remarriage, and his inability to adjust to school. Feeling trapped by these circumstances, he resorts to self-harm by hitting his head with a stone. Miyazaki revealed that his inspiration for making this movie came in part from meeting boys and girls who hurt themselves. In a time of emotional instability, the grey heron appears in front of Mahito. The heron stays close and eventually begins to speak in human language. Help! Mahito! Help! During this turmoil, Mahito reads the novel How Do You Live that his biological mother sent to him. How Do You Live is a children's novel by Genzaburo Yoshino that Miyazaki read in elementary school. The book profoundly impacted him. As you may know, the Japanese title of this movie translates directly to How Do You Live, yet the movie has its own story which is completely different from the book. The story of the book is about a boy named Koperu. He learns a broader perspective that he is part of the world, rather than the world revolving around him. That's why the boy is nicknamed after Copernicus. Mahito experiences deep emotions when he reads the book. Maybe Miyazaki wanted the audience to read it. Before reading the book, Mahito doesn't go looking for Natsuko, even though he sees her go into the forest. His spiritual growth is evident when he decides to look for her after reading the book. The movie takes its time before Mahito enters the fantasy world. At about 50 minutes, it serves as a substantial first chapter depicting Mahito's inner struggles and spiritual growth in the real world. He first grows up in the real world and then goes to rescue his stepmother and his young biological mother, Lady Himi, who are both trapped in the other world. Miyazaki shared his motivation for creating the boy and the heron with the main staff. It's easy for me to portray a bright, energetic girl or a boy with a sense of justice and physical strength. The real me is not like that. I thought I couldn't deal with what's been nestled in my heart since birth. That's why I've never made such movies. But one book inspired Miyazaki to delve into the aspect that he had kept hidden. It is The Book of Lost Things by John Connolly, published in 2006. Miyazaki was particularly inspired by the way the novel deals with a boy's Oedipus complex. He felt he needed to step into that essential aspect of his life before completing his creative journey. The book and the boy and the heron share similarities, especially in the first part of the stories. To put it simply, the book of lost things unfolds in World War II era England, following a young boy named David. After losing his wife to illness, David's father remarries a woman named Rose. She soon becomes pregnant with David's brother. Suffering from mental instability, David begins to see the crooked man and hears his late mother's voice. The crooked man then leads David to a beautiful yet cruel cool water world. The other similarities include the extensive first chapter in the real world before entering the other world, the protagonist's self-injury, and the true identity of the lord of the other world. In the film, the heron man draws the protagonist into another world, just like the crooked man in the Book of Lost Things. Why is the heron man a grey heron? In the Book of Lost Things, David sees the crooked man in his room and calls his father. But when the father enters the room, he finds only a magpie, a bird. In the Boy and the Heron, the heron man acts as a character that's a bit outside the story's confines. His motives and identity aren't entirely clear. He appears abruptly when the narrative slows down and helps Mahito when he's in trouble. He functions almost as a meta character. In this sense, the heron man resembles a broad character in the 1952 French animated film The King and the Mockingbird. The influence of this film can be seen in many of Miyazaki's works, including The Castle of Cariostro. 
Particularly, the king and the mockingbird inspired Miyazaki's vertical storytelling, in which the main character moves from the bottom to the top and vice versa. In the film, when the main characters call out, Bird! Bird! A bird appears out of nowhere to rescue them. So, the bird is quite an opportunistic character, just like the heron man. Also, as suggested by the title, the king and the mockingbird features a dictatorial king, similar to the parakeet king in the boy and the heron. The heron man has a complex personality that's not easy to trust. Even though he argues with Mahito all the time, he ends up accompanying Mahito on his journey. In this sense, I'd say the model for the character is Ghibli's film producer Toshio Suzuki. Suzuki is the driving force behind Ghibli's commercial success in Japan. He didn't hesitate to twist the essence of Miyazaki's films for promotional purposes in order to make them a hit. Suzuki's marketing strategies sometimes infuriated Miyazaki. For instance, the trailer for Poco Rosso featured a lot of aerial combat, making it look like an action-packed adventure movie. However, it's true that Ghibli has achieved box office success in part due to Suzuki's marketing skills. Suzuki and Miyazaki's relationship overlaps with that of Mahito and the Heron Man. The Heron Man tells Mahito lies like, your mother is alive, you didn't see the dead body, did you? Mahito is skeptical, but he goes along with the Heron Man's story anyway. At the end of the day, everything goes well, and they become friends. Also, the Heron Man's appearance resembles Saruta, who appears in several Osamu Tezuka manga. The Heron Man's prominent nose bears a strong resemblance to Saruta's. Before becoming an animator, Miyazaki aspired to be a manga artist and was greatly influenced by Tezuka. Mahito and the old maid Keriko venture to the tower that connects to the other world in search of Natsuko. Above the tower's entrance, there's an inscription in ancient Italian. Fecemi la divina potestate. It's part of an inscription on the gates of hell from Dante's Divine Comedy. It continues with La summa sapienza e l primo amore. It means the divine omnipotence, the highest wisdom, and the primal love created me. Mahito shoots an arrow at the Heroman and it hits him. On Grand Uncle's order, the Heroman leads Mahito to where Natsuko is. At that moment, the Grand Uncle drops a rose where Mahito is. The language of the rose is you are the only one. This may represent the Grand Uncle's wish to make Mahito the heir of the world he has created. The floor of the tower dissolves and Mahito falls into the other world. The first sandy beach he lands on is a hell, yet strangely serene. This silent world with the scent of death reminds me of the train on the sea in Spirited Away, or the silent world that Sosuke and Ponyo come across beyond the tunnel. Tons of phantom ships float along the beach. The sheen would have reminded many viewers of the airplane graveyard in Paul Colossal. Mahito stumbles into this tower during World War II. Maybe the ghosts of the world dead are haunting the phantom ship. The Isle of the Grave nearby, when Mahito descends to the other world, resembles Arnold Buckland's painting Isle of the Dead. Both the movie and the painting feature cypress trees, which symbolize death, mourning, immortality, and rebirth. This other world is a fusion of the art that influenced Miyazaki in his youth. The Golden Gate on this grave isle may have been inspired by the 1957 Soviet animated film The Snow Queen. In The Snow Queen, gates appear as the main character travels from place to place. The influence of the movie can also be seen in the character design of the Grand Uncle, the lonely king of another world. The inscription on the Golden Gate reads Wareo manabu mono wa shesu, meaning the one who learns from me will die. This proverb comes from the Chinese martial arts. It means that learning and creating from teachings leads to life, while mere imitation leads to death. A Japanese novelist, Fusao Hayashi, quoted this saying in his mystery novel called Four Characters. In the novel, the main character, a politician, knows his government in Nanjing is shaky, but he does nothing, and eventually perishes along with the government. In other words, he ruined himself by pondering to the power. At the end of the story, that phrase is quoted to mean, if you become like me, you will die. These words probably reflect Miyazaki's philosophy. There's this show called The Never Ending Man about Hayao Miyazaki. In one part, Miyazaki is storyboarding the boy and the heron while looking at this manga by Soji Yamakawa called Bakudan Circus. Yamakawa Soji was an artist known for the picture story genre that gained popularity after World War II. 
He created stories about an active boy who helps people and solves conflicts in the forest. Mahito's adventure in the boy and the heron is inspired by Yamakawa's works. Basically, the grand uncle's world is a mix of things that inspired Miyazaki back in the day. It's kinda like a play straight out of Miyazaki's childhood dreams. Isao Takahata, renowned for Only Yesterday and Grave of the Fireflies, is another legendary director who, along with Miyazaki, established Ghibli's glorious history. For Miyazaki, Takahata was not only a lifelong competitor but also a deeply respected mentor. Film producer Toshio Suzuki says that the person Miyazaki most wanted to see his films was always Takahata. Recognizing the young Miyazaki's potential, Takahata provided a chance for his rise as an animation director, an act that Miyazaki deeply appreciates. Miyazaki first worked with Takahata on the great adventure of the Horus, Prince of the Sun, and the scene where Mahito sails out to the sea where Skiriko is tribute to that film. According to producer Suzuki, Miyazaki originally envisioned a plot in which Takahata, as the grand uncle, would advise Miyazaki, as Mahito, on how to live his life. However, as Miyazaki was writing the storyboard, Takahata passed away in 2018. After Takahata's passing away, Miyazaki couldn't storyboard for two months. Since then, the grand uncle had not appeared in the storyboarding process. But later, at the very end of the story, the grand uncle, symbolic of Takahata, reappeared to ask Mahito to take over his world. Meanwhile, as for the character design of the grand uncle, I believe that Lafkerio Horn is the model for the character. Lafkerio Horn, also known as Koizumi Yakumo, was an Irish Greek scholar who introduced Japanese culture and literature to the West. Natsuko mentions that the grand uncle was quite well read, and the photo suggests that he was a Westerner who settled in Japan. The old maid mentioned the grand uncle built this tower based on the meteorite that fell after the Meiji restoration. Han also came to Japan at that time and married a Japanese woman. The crest of his Japanese family was a grey heron. His most famous work is Kwai Dan, an English translation of Japanese ghost stories. When the old maid tells Maito's father a story about this pagoda, he says, Is it Kwai Dan? Meaning, is it a ghost story? Han was also fascinated by the paranormal, much like the grand uncle's interest in the meteorite. Han traveled extensively from Ireland to France, the United States, the West Indies, and Japan. This may explain why birds from the different parts of the world inhabit the Grand Uncle's world. The place where Mahito first descended into that world reminds me of the coast of Ireland where Lafkerio Horn grew up. On either side of that stone grave is Stonehenge. Stonehenge is also a world heritage site in Horn's native England. I mentioned earlier that Arnold Buckland's painting Isle of the Dead resembles the Isle of the Grave in the film. Some say the painting was based on the English cemetery where Buckland's infant daughter, Maria, was buried. The parakeets may symbolize people who act collectively without much thinking. Unlike Mahito who thinks independently, Miyazaki portrays the parakeets as those who follow the crowd. They eat, work, and drink alcohol in the Grand Uncle's Tower. With their greed fueled by this mass consumption, the parakeets want everything. Fascinated by their leader, the Parakeet King, they try to wrest control of the world from the Grand Uncle. Mahito and Lady Himi break the taboo of entering the birth house. The king uses Lady Himi as a bargaining chip to wrest control of the world from the Grand Uncle. The Parakeet crowd holds up signs praising the Parakeet King with the word Duke. The Italian pronunciation of the word is similar to Duce, which has been associated with the Italian dictator Mussolini. This is probably a metaphor that the flag of parakeets represents a fascist party, and the parakeet king symbolizes Mussolini. In Miyazaki's Porco Verso, the main character, Porco, is being hunted by the secret police and the air force because he refuses to cooperate with the Italian fascist regime. My viewer kindly told me the scene where the parakeets hide weapons behind their backs resembles the Fleischer's short film Bimbo's Initiation from the Betty Boop cartoon series. Miyazaki is a fan of the Fleischer's cartoons, and their influence can be seen in many of Miyazaki's earlier works.
The birth house was quite common back in the days in Japan because blood was considered kegare, meaning impurity. A pregnant woman was isolated in a birth house and it was forbidden for others to enter. In the Kojiki, there is a legend about a princess who set fire to her birth house and gave birth to prove that her child was the child of the father deity. This story conveys the strength of the mother who gives birth even in the frames. This image overlaps with Himi who chooses to return to the real world to give birth to Mahito knowing that she is destined to die in the fire. The bundle of paper stretched out in the birth house is a world to world of evil. The stone that created this world tried to drive away Mahito and Himi with a light like electricity. To the stone, Natsuko's baby could have been another candidate for the successor of this world. Natsuko could also have been called to that tower by the power of the stone, just as the grey heron tried to take Mahito to the other world. The world view in the Grand Uncle's Pagoda, where does it come from? Miyazaki's storytelling philosophy is similar to that of Haruki Murakami. When storyboarding, Miyazaki delves into the unconscious, so some aspects of his stories defy logic. Yet there are some aspects of the Grand Uncle's world that can be explained. Where Mahito landed is hell. Also, since Wada Wada are born into the real world, it seems the concept of a reincarnation exists in this world. Perhaps subconsciously, Miyazaki drew inspiration from the Buddhist notion of the six realms of reincarnation as he envisioned this alternate world. Buddhism teaches that after death, good deeds during life lead to a world without suffering, while bad deeds lead to a world of suffering. The six realms of reincarnation are heaven, human, demigod, animal, hungry ghost, and hell. In the movie, Mahito first descends to the Hell Realm. Next is the world where pelicans, Warawara, and the shadow people are looking for food. In the Buddhist teachings, those who have gone to the Hungry Ghost Realm will always suffer from hunger and dryness. The next place where the parakeet live is the Animal Realm, where non-human animals go. The Human Realm is the world of human suffering. The Demigod Realm is a place of constant conflict, a world of hatred and envy. Japan during World War II, where Mahito lives in the real world, may fall under the human and demigod realms. And then there's the heaven realm. There's a starry sky behind the Grand Uncle when Mahito first sees him. It's implied in the movie that the Grand Uncle made a deal with a stone in the heaven realm and created this other world. The Herman leads Mahito in the other world, much like Vajurius leads Dante in Dante's Divine Comedy. Similarly, Lady Himi leads Mahito to the Grand Uncle, as Beatrice leads Dante to heaven. Finally, Dante dialogues with a celestial being in the Divine Realm, just as Mahito dialogues with the Grand Uncle in heaven. When the Grand Uncle's heaven collapses in the final act, the ground gives way, revealing a starry sky below. Now, let me summarize the positional relationship of the different realms in this world. There is the human world, and below that is the realms of hell and hungry souls. Above that is the animal realm, the world of the parakeets, and then heaven. The tower that connects these realms stands in different places in the world at the same time. The Grand Uncle's world is probably composed in such a positional relationship. The Grand Uncle in the movie is based on Isao Takahata. Producer Toshio Suzuki suggests that Mahito may represent the version of Miyazaki he aspired to be, while the Parakeet King may represent who Miyazaki was. Suzuki even guesses that the tower may symbolize Jiburi. Please keep in mind that these interpretations are not definitive at all. How one interprets a movie is up to each viewer. Yet, Suzuki's perspective provides a consistent and compelling interpretation of the meaning of the building blocks. The number of blocks the Grand Uncle stacked was 8. This may represent the number of feature films Takahata has directed. Later, the Grand Uncle offers Mahito the 13 blocks. This may represent the number of feature films that Miyazaki has directed on his own. Federico Ferrini's film Eight and a Half also has a title with the number of films the director had made up to that point. Counting a co-directed film as half a film, his eighth and a half film is Eight and a Half. Miyazaki saw Eight and a Half during the production of The Boy and the Heron. After watching it, Miyazaki said, Who is this guy? He thinks the same thing I do. 
The boy and the hero and eight and a half share the same theme, both deal with the agony and chaos of filmmaking. The grand uncle offers Mahito the building blocks. This could symbolize the fact that Takahata recognized Miyazaki's potential and gave him the chance to become an animation director, which Miyazaki truly appreciates. The grand uncle advises Mahito to stack a block every three days. This could mean that Miyazaki usually worked on one movie for about three years. A documentary that closely followed Miyazaki during the production of The Boy and the Heron aired in Japan on December 16th. It was revealed that Takahata once said in Miyazaki's presence that there are aspects of Miyazaki that have yet to be revealed in his works, hoping that one day he would show them. During the early stages of the production of The Boy and the Heron, Miyazaki said to the main staff, I'm aware that I've been creating animation while hiding crucial aspects of myself. I thought I couldn't deal with what nestled in my heart since birth. That's why I never made such movies. But now I think that if I don't, I might end up not expressing something important. This could be the part Takahata said Miyazaki was hiding, and maybe this is what Mahito means by malice. Although the word malice is used in the movie, what it means would be closer to the dark side of one's heart. Perhaps it was this feeling that drove Miyazaki to make The Boy and the Heron. The feeling that he hadn't yet fulfilled Takahata's wish that Miyazaki would one day make a movie about his own hidden side. When Mahito confronts the grand uncle for the first time, he realizes that the stone contains malice. This probably means that Takahata's works reflect his inner world, including his dark side. For example, in Pompoko, humans are depicted as invading the habitat of raccoon dogs. The grand uncle offers much to the 13 blocks and says these blocks contain no malice. This reflects the fact that Miyazaki has not shown his inner darkness in the 13 films he has directed. The Parked King, a representation of who Miyazaki was, quickly stacks these blocks. Of course the tower of blocks becomes unstable and he eventually breaks it with his sword. On the other hand, Mahito, the person Miyazaki wanted to become, does not accept the 13 blocks offered by the Grand Uncle, symbolizing Isao Takahata. Acknowledging the dark side within himself, Mahito replies that he can't touch the 13 blocks without malice. Mahito confronts his own darkness head on, just as Miyazaki himself did when he, for the first time, depicted his own darkness in the boy and the heron. Acknowledging his malice, Mahito chooses to return to the real world where people kill and rob each other. The world that will eventually become the sea of fire as the grand uncle says. The rich, serene, and beautiful world created by the grand uncle resembles the purified lunar world in Isao Takahata's The Tale of the Princess Kaguya, or the garden in the manga version of Naushika of the Valley of the Wind, realm free of impurity and wrongdoing. Yet Naushika chooses to return to the real world, which is filled with malice, impurity, and contradiction. In fact, when Mahito returns to the real world, he is covered in blood droppings, an obvious metaphor for the impurity of the real world. Yet, Mahito chooses to return and rescue his two mothers from the fictional world, even though he knows his own mother's inevitable fate. In the animated films that inspired Miyazaki in his youth, a bird often serves as a guiding figure. In The Boy and the Heron, Miyazaki frees the bird trapped in the tower, the world of fiction. When Natsuko sees the birds return to their natural state, she says, cute. Mahito says to the grand uncle that he'll make friends and brings back a piece of stone to the real world. Miyazaki is making Mahito choose the same path he did, living in the real world, making friends, and creating art while suffering. In a way, Miyazaki is validating the way he has lived to this day. Yet, at the same time, this film is also his declaration of a new beginning. The crops of the tower may represent the end of Ghibli, with no successor to Takahata and Miyazaki. The grand uncle symbolizing Takahata vanishes with the tower. Since Takahata's passing away, Miyazaki has been haunted by his phantom. It stopped Miyazaki's storyboarding for two months. Perhaps Miyazaki was trying to say goodbye to Takahata by writing this story. In the documentary, Miyazaki says of this scene, I finally buried Takahata. Mahito returns to the real world from the grand uncle's tower. Perhaps by writing this story, Miyazaki himself was trying to return to the real world from the realm where Takahata's phantom lingered. 
The Boy and the Heron is also Miyazaki's tribute to his lifelong mentor. In the end credits, the kanji character Saki in Miyazaki's name has been changed to another character with the same sound. This may suggest Miyazaki has been reborn as a new animation creator. The lyrics of the film's theme song, The Grove by Yonezu Kenshi, read as follows. Opening the door now, as if revealing a secret. The joy of touching hands, the sadness of letting go. Endlessly I'll sketch these, like spinning a globe. Every Ghibli movie has the sign of the end at the end, but in The Boy and the Heron, this sign is not there. It may suggest our lives go on, even after the movie ends. Or, I heard that Miyazaki had already submitted the proposal for the next project while working on this movie. What an incredible energy! It could also mean that Miyazaki is not done yet. The legendary crew in the history of Japanese animation served as the main crew of The Boy and the Heron. Those who had previously worked with Miyazaki reunited to produce what may be his final film. Also, the list of animation companies credited in the end credit makes me cry. Studio Panic, which carries on Ghibli legacy with stuff from Ghibli. Studio Color by Hideaki Anno of Evangelion. Studio Chizu by Mamoru Hosoda, who was originally slated to direct Howard's Moving Castle. Comics Wave Film by Makoto Shinkai of Your Name. Production IG by Mamoru Oshii. Ufotable of Demon Slayer. Studio 4 Degree Celsius of Children of the Sea. And more. Miyazaki may not have found a direct successor to Ghibli, but his influence has planted the seeds for future growth in the animation industry. Speaking of seeds, when Mahito reads the book How Do You Live, the first page shows Millet's painting, The Sower. This painting is a trademark of the book's publisher, Iwanami Shoten, but the image of the sower appears so large on the screen that I cannot help but feel that maybe Miyazaki himself is a sower. When Mahito returns to the real world, the Heroman tells him that he will eventually forget that world and the power of the stone. But as Zeniber says, you never really forget what happened. The fall of the tower may symbolize the end of Ghibli. This movie may be a curtain call for the legendary animation company. But what Ghibli films left us will remain in our hearts, much like Chihiro's hair tie. The Boy and the Heron stands far from the entertainment films Miyazaki had been making. It is a work of art, developed over seven years with one of Japan's largest film budgets and the collaboration of legendary animators. The very existence of this film is a miracle that only the most accomplished animation director can achieve. It's not only the masterpiece we have expected from this legendary director, but it's also his frontier. In the movie, Miyazaki reveals the darker facets of his inner world, a sight he has never shown before. This film is more Miyazaki than any of his previous works, and at the same time, it's a departure from any of his previous works. It's a surprisingly fresh masterpiece that resonates with Miyazaki's philosophy of life, his eternal quest for transformation. So, that's it. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on the movie. Please let me know in the comments. Don't forget to hit the like button. If you really like this video, please support me with super thanks so I can make better videos for my next project. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. See you in the next video.